This conference will now be recorded. Sorry. I'm glad. <laughs> Good morning. I'm glad to welcome you this morning to this uh, second energy sufficiency webinar. So um, I am uh, organizing this webinar uh, with uh, in coordination with Fedarem. So Melissa Miklos is here and also Dominique Bourges are with us this morning. Um, so um, I will introduce quickly the, the webinar maybe. Melissa, can you show us the next slide? So uh, the agenda this morning, um, we will have three presentations after my introduction. Whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, so the presentation, uh, so it's a very, it's a, it's, a, it's a girly webinar this morning. So we'll have Joanna Wallin from Energy, Energy Contour Cidost, Terra Silvander from a Northern Small Energy Agency, and afterwards, Crystal Little Green, um, again from Energy Contour Cidost. Uh, so the, the the presentation will will be uh, take place will take place just after my quick introduction. Next slide, please. Yeah, we have a problem with the slide. Yeah, just to remember you that there will be a third seminar in January uh, dedicated to digital sufficiency. And for this morning, uh, just a quick reminder. Now we begin with the poll. So everybody can can go to the Slido to Slido and can answer to this short question: What is your mode of transport to work? So we have. One or two minutes for the the answers to the poll. Okay. Let me, I would just like to say that I encourage everybody to join Slido with your phones in the app or on the website. It's really easy to use and we will have uh, several questions related to all presentations and to the discussion. So even if you don't answer this one, please try to, to be uh, ready for the, the next one. Okay, people are answering. So Melissa, just tell me when you want me to continue. I think we can close it here, Marie-Laure. Oh. Okay, so that's for our speakers. Um, so what is energy sufficiency? Just a quick reminder. Um, this is the first step for energy transition before efficiency and before the development of renewables. How can we define energy sufficiency? Next slide, please. So energy sufficiency is an approach that aims to reduce energy consumption through changes in behavior, lifestyle, and collective organization. So next slide, please. And we can define uh, four axes for energy sufficiency, uh, the dimensional sufficiency, user sufficiency, collaborative sufficiency, and also structural sufficiency. Um, you can see the definition. Uh, and I will talk just quickly about an example of structural sufficiency the creation uh, of another space. So um, this example uh, is dealing with the tactical global planning in Barcelona. Uh, what is tactical global planning? Uh, that means short-term actions for long-term change. 
um, during uh, this particular period of COVID, uh, the city of Barcelona uh, restructures uh, entire sections of neighborhood in favor of soft mobility uh, with uh, social public spaces. That is to say, they add a lot of vegetalization, smart street furniture, uh, games for um, for children, and so on, <clears throat> and also restriction of car access, and this deal dealt with the consultation of local inhabitants, uh, and the municipality of Barcelona decided also to uh, continue to pursue this and. Uh, uh, this, uh, this is a, a, a very interesting uh, example of um, structural sufficiency uh, and uh, I mean structural sufficiency, so of uh, energy sufficiency and public space. So now we are going to give the floor to our first speaker, Joanna. So Joanna, please, we are listening to you. To you. All right, thank you, thank you. I'm going to talk a bit about cargo bikes. Uh, cargo bikes that not only need to be a big city phenomena, but there is a great potential even in smaller urban areas. And I'm going to talk a bit about that. So, my name is Johanna Wallin, and I'm a communications officer and project manager at the Energy Agency for Southeast Sweden. And for several years now, I've been working a lot with cargo bikes. And so let me share some of my findings with you. Uh, but first, uh, I would like just to talk a short bit about us and uh, the Energy Agency for Southeast Sweden uh, is an organization jointly owned by municipalities and the county councils in the three counties in the southeast part of Sweden. And we have in total 15 energy agencies uh, covering all of Sweden. And um, <clears throat> this organization is called uh, the Swedish Energy Agencies. And then on European level, we have Federen, uh, which I hope you all are familiar with. Um, there's around 350 uh, energy agencies all around um, uh, Europe. And we're a vital part of the energy policies for the European Union. All of us aim to increase energy efficiency and renewable energy sources, just as Marie-Laure just said. And today is about what we call energy sufficiency. That's an important part of the sustainable development. All right, back to bicycles or uh, cargo bikes. <clears throat> Did you know that in urban communities, around 80% of the car trips are shorter than three to four kilometers? And uh, where a normal bike or bus might not be a convenient alternative, an electric cargo bike might very well do the job. There's a great potential in this modal shift. <clears throat> but cargo bikes are just one piece of the whole transport system puzzle. There's just not one solution for us to achieve the sustainable transport system. Um, the first question you can ask yourself is, is this trip really necessary? That's the first. Uh, but it's not only then about choosing the right type of transport or the right type of fuel. Uh, it's also about making other choices. Uh, and for us as an energy agency, we help people to change behavior and in this instance, choose cargo bike instead of a van or car. So um, cargo bikes can in many areas be the energy sufficiency solution. We have a project running right now called Copium within the South Baltic uh, program. And uh, we're in, in the last part of the project and I'll tell you a bit about what we've uh, discovered so far. Uh, but the project is, um, the concept of the project is built upon lending schemes aimed at private users, municipal services or businesses. And as a cargo bike is a substantial investment uh, so giving potential users uh, a chance of trying the cargo bike uh, for a period of time, that can provide them the experience needed to make the decision to buy one. Uh, 
uh, and this longer period of time is important because you sort of use it in your own day-to-day -day life and see that it really can make a difference both for your health and for the economics in your um, organization or your family and for for the environment of course so some uh, some things about our findings so far uh, i would um, talk a bit about bike libraries um, they're an efficient way to to promote cargo bikes so we've seen uh, at uh, swedish uh, other bike libraries is libraries that between 20 to 40 percent of lenders tend to buy a bike within two years of their lending period so and as again i say the longer you let them borrow the bike for the better chance it is to see if they can fit into their lives another thing we saw is that the social economic groups with high social standards or interested in innovations are the most likely to buy a cargo bike so if you're doing campaigns to try to get uh, more people to shift cargo bikes aim your campaigns at the right target groups do a thorough analysis it's always good and uh, as we say start with the low hanging fruits <clears throat> a shift uh, from cargo to cargo bikes from vans or cars can be for a city uh, beneficial uh, in case of the reduced emissions, reduced noise, and le the less traffic congestion that can occur. <clears throat> and climate wise, it uh, shows uh, our Swedish uh, traffic researchers have shown that one cargo bike can save up to five tons of carbon dioxide a year compared to a car or van. So you can count yourself if you see the potential and how much uh, carbon dioxide we could actually save. When you're doing campaigns to, to, to promote a, uh, um, a modal shift, find the early adopters. They're important not only to give feedback, but they also will uh, pro provide a positive proof within an organization. When it comes to cargo bikes, it's not like a bike. They can have very many shapes and uses depending on the area. So cargo bikes can have two, three or four wheels. They can ca have car cargo in front of them or in the back. They can be designed to carry people, cargo or provide services. The type you need uh, depends on what you need to use it for. So be sure to do a thorough analysis before purchase to make sure that the cargo bike is used the way you want it to be used. <clears throat> and lastly, when it comes to infrastructural planning, uh, these bike plans or infrastructural planning needs to address also the bigger size of a cargo bike compared to a normal bike, like for bike lane width and parking and such. So that's a, an important thing to have in mind. But still, cargo bikes are still much smaller than a car or a van. <clears throat> During next year, we will combine these findings and more uh, into guidelines for communities or municipalities that want to uh, promote a modal shift to cargo bikes. So please check in on our website, cobion.eu, from time to time to check our progress and so on. But already today, we've got lots of inspiring examples of cargo bike use from both municipal services, businesses, and private users. So please go and visit cobion.eu for more inspiration. So on the behalf of all our project consortium, Thank you for your time. And please write, if you have any questions, write them in the chat and I'll look into them and we'll have a, a Q&A session in the end of the webinar. Thank you. And uh, Melissa, would you uh, grab the controls and show the Slido? Um, your, your microphone was shut off, but... Right, so, uh, did you listen Sorry to what that's... I said? Yeah, if you listen to what I said, please uh, check uh, this slide up and see if you remember um, 
how how long the the eighty percent of the trips in new urban areas are. And do you need to go to the next slide? I don't see the question on the slide or yet. I do see it. Am I the only okay. one seeing it right now? No, it's okay. We see it. Okay, it's just my my phone then. So 80% of the trips in urban areas are between one and two kilometers, three and four kilometers, or five, six kilometers. Yeah, what do you say? Seven of you have already voted, that's great. Uh, I won't because I know the answer, so. Let's see, can we, we go to the next? Or oh, maybe we should wait to some more of answers. So maybe, they don't get... maybe some more seconds, yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's see if we have more, because we have 24 people total. So some of you are, are lazy right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well. All right. Shall I move to the results? Yes, please. Oh, good. <laughs> Most of you paid lots of attention. Thank you very much. So, thank you, Melissa. Thank you very much, Joanna. Thank you, Joanna. So, the, 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 okay, the majority have the right response. Okay. So, maybe now, thank you, Joanna. Thank you. It's a very inspiring example, very interesting, maybe for, for Paris. Uh, and now we are going to give the floor to Thérèse. So Thérèse, Thérèse. Merci beaucoup. Uh, I won't do this in French, maybe next time. Um, I'm glad I have the opportunity to speak here. Some of you maybe heard uh, me and my colleague speak about ready in May, but I hope you all have this one on your door. Please don't disturb, I'm in a digital meeting. So um, the picture you see here is me talking on a national conference yesterday about transport efficient society. This is a very uh, popular topic at the moment, digital meetings. I think we all had them a lot, uh, good and bad ones. Uh, and today I will talk a little bit more about the results we are now summing up since the project is finalizing its activities. I'm the project owner of this, uh, operative project owner of this project and also developed the project. So, now I now have control, let's see. As a nerd, I love trying different meeting tools and services. They all have their pro and cons. I still see the first slide, Melissa. Um, yes. How did you try to change them? You can uh, move them from both here arrows if you want. Both mouse. Okay, I'll try to give you control one more time, otherwise I'll do it myself. Okay, second slide, great. So one of us made it. This is about trying a lot. This is about trying and dare to try. Otherwise, we don't get better. Uh, the Red Project in Brief is about increasing and improving digital meetings and implement them in, in uh, at least 50 uh, public sector organizations, um, municipalities, county, county councils, and public municipality-owned companies. Um, we use proven methodology, training, and of course, peer-to-peer -peer learning and exchange of experience. The third group uh, is huge, uh, all 290 municipalities, the 21 county, uh, county councils, regions in Sweden, and also 1,800 municipality-owned companies. Um, the funding comes from the Swedish Energy Agency. We have uh, roughly about um, 550,000 euro. We got a bit extra due when the pandemic, um, due after the pandemic outbreak, which we were happy for. And this is an NG of agents, energy agencies of Sweden project and based here in energy agency in Northern Småland. And we started in June 2018, which I'm most happy for. 
we had a lot of training before we all got online, uh, more or less voluntarily. And we're now summing up the project. And Joanna talked about energy agencies of Sweden, so I won't do that. But this is a success factor is that we are covering the whole of Sweden and we have this community where we share experience um, on a more regular basis. And we have more than 50 participants in the project, so we reached that goal. And if you see, if we overlap these maps, we're covering the most part of the long Sweden. And we're very proud of that. And this is the product group. Um, maybe you have seen um, my colleagues. We have one product manager doing full time, communications officer half time, and the other us are doing bits here and there. And I wanted to show you this because we're working a strictly digital project group. Um, I don't think everybody met everybody actually physically. And I don't remember because I'm so used to meeting people digitally. But we are part of three different organizations and access to three different uh, IT organizations, so to speak, and programs and instant messaging. And how do we communicate uh, smoothly? It's been a quite big challenge and it's changing during the project as well from Skype for business to Teams and so on. It's kind of your part of your five a day, Skype, Zoom, Pexip, whatever meetings, Zoom. And uh, uh, what we've been offering uh, is a lot of training opportunities and webinars, knowledge. And uh, one specialty has been for political meetings on local and regional level. And if you saw the maps, we had um, this map with regional teams where regional energy agencies or can work with their usual partners in crime. They don't need to be a member in uh, Ready or signed up for doing the things Ready want you to do, but you can be an indirect member and practice together and start a better or create a better regional cooperation, which we've seen, which is super nice. Regions talking, having better connections with their municipalities and also businesses, uh, companies. And networking, of course, a lot of networking. Oh, you work with this, you should talk to them and so on. And advice. Uh, it's happening so fast now. One thing being the thing one day is updated the next day. So a lot of advice. You check this out, you try this and so on. And of course, monitoring and evaluation is a big part. We have done different surveys, surveys and also been providing best practices and also bad examples. We can learn a lot from them as well. Uh, experts and concrete methods. We've been having a smorgasbord, as we say in Sweden. And our focus has been to uh, uh, really highlight digital meetings as an important part of a transport efficient society, which is energy sufficiency within the, the transport sector. But no one really owns this question about digital meetings. Is it transport efficiency? Is it digitalization? Or is it energy sufficiency? hard to tell. If we don't get the owner of the question, we don't get this big change that we really need to make this happen in a good way. And when we started a project, our approach was to meet our uh, participants where they were at the moment, which was so different levels. So we're working in an agile way. And also we, we've been learning by, learning by doing ourselves during the time. It really forced us to try all these things out. And we see digital meeting as a uh, a pr tool for continuous improvements and a part of your could be a part of your management system within your organization. And the backbone of our project is the 10 step methodology taken step by step uh, in which order you prefer. It's not a strict one to 10, which also can help you implement and get the things done that needs to be done to make this happen within the whole organization, because this is HR, it's IT, it's a lot of people that need to be involved. There's a lot of text here. I don't um, ask you to read it, but it is also part of our sibling project, the REM project, which the Swedish Transport Administration developed in 2011. And they've been working with government departments and so on, and they developed this one. It's a good mythology. And results. I said, we're summing up the project. We applied for uh, um, a continuation, which uh, luckily 
or unluckily, can you say that? Anyway, didn't uh, get approved. But we've, uh, during the, uh, the project period, we had at least uh, 25 completed webinars and workshops, over 70 training sessions. We have PTs in the until meetings in the project, so you can really get into shape. Uh, Skype, Teams, Cisco, Zoom, within total over 1,000 participants. So we hope that we hope uh, continue to train their colleagues and so on, so we get it's really good uh, um, dissemination of the project and learnings. Eight uh, and counting training sessions for these local and regional politicians. I don't know how it is. In, all over Europe now, but in Sweden you can see all these funny small clips about it was chaos. We had this political meeting and it was chaos. Can you unmute your mic? I can't hear what you're saying, and so on. And it's about democracy. It's really important uh, to make it work. And we have also supported or arranged 11 diff uh, digital conferences. And when it comes to energy efficiency, you see some numbers here. Uh, this this is a small municipality with about thousand. 4,000 employees that saved about 312 megawatt hours uh, compared with pre-COVID. They made the same survey last year and now they're comparing with COVID when people are working more from home and travel less. Um, there will come more numbers and uh, data when the project is final in the final report. We also had daily seminars and training system uh, when the outbreak in, of the pandemic um, came in Sweden before and after Easter. And this, of course, data is important. So we had a survey to map digital meeting habits. We developed checklists, tutorials, films. We've been lobbying. This is important for the digital meetings. And we also wrote an application with the Federen about Ready Europe. Um, and we will work, continue work on that. Uh, but most of all, we need good, efficient, inclusive, interactive meetings because I think uh, we're all super tired of bad digital meetings where you fall asleep or you watch your email or whatever. But we are people, we still want to meet and we need to meet and we can meet to make things happen better and faster if we have good connection and relations also in the digital world. This is me googling quickly. Uh, Zoom fatigue, better digital meetings, better meetings. We all need better meetings in general. And what I'm working on now is uh, trying to start up a Swedish uh, excellence center for digital cooperation because it's not only about meetings, it's also workshops, webinars, strategic meetings, conferences, you name it. So, we know there is a lot of hassle with digital meetings, Zoom fatigue, bad backs, and bad connection and everything. But I would now like you to use a Slido to write down what is the best thing with digital meetings. So please continue on Slido. I will write down, write down myself. Thank you, Teresa. So I will go also to the Slido in order to answer your question. I see we have someone who didn't really understand Slido. Uh, so Sarah, you can edit your response if you want to change it. Ah, actually she did. All right, 15, 14, 15 people, I think that's about what we had for the last one. Yeah, so should we say thank you for the answers and 
at the last slide. So, Therese, are you happy with these answers? <laughs> I am. It. Oh, no, I'm too quick. Looks like you have the control. Yes, I, I didn't know if you wanted to comment the result. Okay. Yeah, I am. Because it's, it's the advantage of digital meetings. We know all the, the, the bad parts of it. I'm happy with the answers. And I don't know if my question came up. It's so, oh, I get it's so easy access to new ex, uh, contacts, experts. They're all available. I love that. I can learn so much more and get things done more easily. So thank you for listening. Uh, I brought down these tips. Um, you know that use the camera if the network allows it. We like to see people. Use the methodology and practice makes perfect and have fun during the time. This is me working from home. Uh, I had a really hard problem a big problem to find a good spot to sit in my small apartment and this was my lamp uh, reflecting in the in the paintings so we had some fun with that so thank you and over to melissa again or marie of course you're the moderator thank you therese thank you so now time to give the floor to our next speaker, Christelle. Hello, Christelle. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Um, I heard you quite slowly, so I hope you can hear me well. Uh, Melissa, can you just uh, verify that my sound is okay? Yes, I think it's Marie-Laure, actually. Yes, Marie-Laure, sometimes there are issues when you speak. You speak like okay. a robot. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope you will hear me then. Well, my name is Christa Liljegren and I'm the Managing Director of the Energy Agency for Southeast Sweden. And I'm also a Vice President for Transport and Mobility in Federen. So I'm really glad to be here. Uh, I will do a presentation for one of my colleagues who has been, uh, who is sick today. So I hopefully I will do his presentation justice. Uh, I will give you an example of one of our actions towards uh, sustainable mobility. Uh, and it's a project called Door to Door with Sustainable Mobility in a Green Kronoberg County. And uh, see if I can move the slides. No. Now I have a control. if I can manage. Wait, uh, Christelle, do you see the, the bar here? You can also just click here if you want. Okay, I try. So, uh, well, when we work with these uh, actions in our energy agency, uh, we are always going towards goals. And together in Europe, we have a, a, a joint goal to reach a climate neutral uh, European Union by 2050. And we need all to get involved in a lot of actions to reach this goal. And one thing that we see is that it's a few of the energy agencies in Europe that are involved in these kinds of projects. So we want to involve more people. And I hope all you who are here, no matter what organization we work, you're working with, are going to join us in these actions. Um, and on our way towards 2050, uh, we have a lot of key targets. For example, we need to, to cut 40% of the green gas, greenhouse gas emissions, and we need to increase our share of renewable energy, and we need to improve the energy efficiency in all our actions in houses and in transport, for example. Um, so, and by 2030, we should also have been reaching a far away to reach it to achieve the global goals and when we're talking about oh my god it's very small <laughs> when we're talking about um, transport uh, one important goal is to reduce our um, uh, the effects we have on the climate and one big issue in Sweden is all the transport where people sitting alone in their cars traveling to work, commune to, to work or to spare free spare time activities, to grocery so shops, to school and etc. So um, 
in Sweden, we have also uh, key targets that our energy agency is working towards. And by 2030, we should have reduced the emissions from transport with 70%. And by 2050, we would uh, we are going to be a net zero emission country. And in our region and the the county which this project has been carried out, uh, by 2030, all the tra uh, transports within the county should be fossil free. And by 2050, the county uh, aim, are aiming for to get uh, to be a plus energy county. So we have very specific goals a short period of time uh, to reach them. So we need to work hard. So one way that we are contributing with is by this project. And the goal of the project has been, of course, then to reduce the CO2 emissions from transport. Uh, mainly we have discussed, uh, have been focusing on transport within the county. And it's been commuting to work, uh, to school, to grocery stores um, within work, when on under working hours, so different kind of transport that uh, are carried out in our small region. And one very important task has been to increase awareness and knowledge in different kinds of target groups, both on how to commute, commute and travel more sustainable, uh, but also to reach politicians and a key target. Uh, people that can affect policies and, and uh, make decisions that make the life, uh, sustainable uh, life easier for others. Um, one thing that we wanted to do was to increase the amount of active transport. That means to get out of your car and walk to work or take the bicycle to uh, the, your destination. And sorry for the kids running in the background. Uh, we also wanted to increase the use of public transport, both buses and trains. And oh, one thing that also was important was the measure that was carried out should favor equal transport. That means the, the activities or the measures should be available for both men and women, young and old, um, children and adults. And all these activities together should also increase a better public health. So some of the activities that has been carried out was uh, at first to make a big analysis of the current situation. And there was a collect, we were collecting data through a survey about travel habits. Um, when all this uh, information was uh, gathered, we had a presentation for each of the participant organizations and uh, regions and companies, and together we identified what can be could be improved. By this information, there was a toolbox developed. So how can we uh, get um, uh, a, a movement from a car to a bike, or how can we change behavior? So different tools were uh, developed. And for two years, we have been implementing these tools in the region. And now, in the end of the project, there is a follow-up, uh, the same kind of survey that was um, uh, carried out in the spring 2018 has been carried out now. Uh, and of course, we also had to have some checkups about the COVID-19 effects on the project since uh, it has been, as we have heard before, some changes in our behavior due to this. So how, here we have a presentation opportunity for one of the municipalities when they were analyzing the data from the survey. So it was important that everyone was involved and also <clears throat> themselves can find out what, was our, what are our biggest um, topics to, to, to handle. And one thing that is important when you do this is to be aware. Oh, sorry, to be aware of the situation, so everyone can become purposeful. You know what you're aiming for. So this uh, start analysis has been a key uh, point in the project. So uh, some of the activities then. As I said, one one activity has been to get people out of the car and onto the bikes. Therefore, a bicycle library, library was developed where people, uh, and we had focused on people that uh, in the survey said that I'm going by car everywhere. 
So and I all um, I mostly drive alone in my car. So they were a focus group here, and we wanted them to try out different types of bikes that can fulfill the needs they had for transportation. So it was mainly different kind of electric bikes, but it, as you can see, it was cargo bike, it was foldable bikes, and ordinary. Uh, electric bikes. In total, up to today, uh, a test group of 417 participants have tried uh, these vehicles. And it has been both to travel to and for work, but also in, in the everyday transportation needs. Um, another day, uh, activity, as we said, was to make people aware about uh, the problem and the solutions. So there were and many activities um, for uh, raising awareness to general public and to influence policymaking uh, people like politicians and key decision makers. Um, so finally, no, oh, there was one slide missing. Yeah, we also have education and eco driving for people who needed to take the car uh, within the work. Uh, we had education uh, about how to drive smarter. So 350 people were involved in these. And uh, uh, as um, Therese said, uh, to educate people in virtual meeting is important. And we also include this in the project. And we had a lot of competitions that companies can compete to each other or municipality can compete against each other in who can be um, best in uh, making uh, behavioral changes. So finally, some of the results. Uh, we had on, over 900 participants in the different competition and together uh, they saved 31,500 kilos of CO2 um, when they are had like bicycle to work or did other activities. We had, as I said, 350 participants uh, involved in eco-driving education. And if all of them use these new skills uh, when driving a car within the work, they could save up to 140 kilograms um, CO2 per year. 2,000 people participated in different kind of sustainable travel education. And 14 cargo bikes was procured by the municipality to exchange vehicles, um, fossil fuel vehicles within the organization. Uh, and if we see um, the goals that the project had, uh, the overall result was that they succeeded to reduce CO2 emissions from transports within the country. Uh, they increased the amount of active transport. Uh, they, un, uh, they didn't succeed to increase the use of public transport, and but a lot of it had to do, do with the COVID situation. Uh, they couldn't measure uh, the effects on better public health, but we can see that more people use the bicycles to work, so we assume that it also improved their health. Uh, the, there has been an increase of awareness and knowledge. We see that a lot of policy documents are starting to get evolved. And the, um, we see that both men and women have uh, changed their behavior in the same amount, so uh, the activity had reached both um, uh, these groups. And of course, one of the biggest changes was the increase of the digital meeting, so that since 2018 has increased with over 200%, up to 230% more people uh, have been involved in digital meetings. But of course, COVID helped a lot there. So that was the, the result of this project, um, and I hope you had a go good overview of what we did, and perhaps you can in get inspired to do something uh, similar yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Christelle. Um, thank you for this presentation. Do you... I don't know... I don't remember, Melissa, if we have a slide. Yes, indeed. Just Before now, the just after this presentation or not. Yes. So, please go to the slide. The next question. So, what is the most important measure to adapt the public space to sustainable mobility? 
uh, more space for walking and cycling, subsidies for bike, more pedestrian zones, training courses and awareness raising for new bikers, other. So we will take one or two minutes to answer the poll. doesn't seem to to change anymore should we should we end there yes please ah 14 okay well um yes no so that's the result So, more space for, for walking and cycling is the winner. Yes. Um, before launching the open discussion, and thank again our three speakers, um, I just want to, to have a, a quick comment. Uh, thank you for this very, for these three clever energy sufficient projects. Uh, very clever to tackle climate change. Um, and uh, this project shows that uh, there is a need to develop a clear methodology, to define objectives, targets, to have experimentation. And also, um, I see, I saw the involvement of all stakeholders, citizens, politicians, workers, and so on. Uh, this involvement is really, really important. So, um, attendees and also speakers uh, we are now opening the discussion um, there is two two questions here which means and tools of the space planning to facilitate sufficiency how can i positively influence the people around me and encourage them to adopt eco-responsible attitudes and gestures in the public space um, but this is only two two questions to to launch the discussion, feel free to to have comment to have any comment uh, about these presentations. Uh, you can open your camera if you want your video. Um, don't forget to introduce yourself if you want to comment to add another example also, maybe. Uh, so the discussion is open. If somebody wants to. Take the floor. Maybe I can start uh, to encourage other people to do the same after. Um, yes, actually, I just wanted to raise a question that I saw on Slido from, from Sarah, who was uh, wondering what plus energy uh, mean. I think this was in, in Johanna's presentation, but I'm not sure. So uh, if the speaker who mentioned it could explain it. And uh, myself, I, I also wanted to, to ask a question, but it's for the three speakers, because as we just saw in the last slide, a question, uh, most of us think that the most important measure would be to have more space for cycling and walking, because I think in uh, Western European cities like uh, Brussels, Paris, or even in my city in Liège, in Belgium, we really have no space for working and especially for cycling. So when I hear all the great uh, examples from Sweden, I feel like we're not there yet and that we need more uh, urban planning uh, infrastructure work before being able to change the behavior. So I was wondering if our speakers could uh, speak about that. Did uh, When did this happen, the, the urban planning works to have more space on the the lanes for bicycles or was it already in place? Uh, how did you do it? Thank you very much. Um, Crystal here, I can answer perhaps the first question about the plus energy county. So uh, the purpose with that goal is uh, that uh, the county should produce more energy than they use. 
so they can be uh, an energy supplier to uh, counties that are uh, in the name the, the, uh, the neighbor counties so that is the plan to produce more renewable energy uh, and increase decrease the use of energy so we are a plus energy county by 2050 this does that answer the question yeah exactly thank you christine uh, and I can just start um, with this answer of the next question for the bicycle lanes in my region. Uh, I would like to say that our infrastructure is not fully uh, adapted for cargo bikes or for a um, bicycle commute, but it is also important to uh, have more people wanting more infrastructure. So there is a more demand on politicians to to take new policies about the infrastructure. So we need to have have it both ways, both both expanding the infrastructure for bicycles and, and other types of, of sustainable vehicles, but we also need to have people demanding or wanting these and using them. Because what we have figured out is if you build a new bicycle lane and you don't promote it or uh, giving a good information on how to use it, people won't naturally just start using it. Um, so we need to have behavior change in activities along with the new infrastructure. So we have to work with both um, activities at the same time, from my point of view anyway. Thank you. Yeah, I second that. That's uh, it's Johanna here who talks about the cargo bikes. It's just, it, it's just as Krista says, uh, you need both the behavioral uh, campaigns com together with the infrastructure uh, structure planning for it to work. And we see that, we saw that in this project in, in for example, uh, Gdynia, where they built uh, nice parking spaces. This was for, for uh, ordinary bikes, but they built bike lanes and bike parking spots and everything. But no, n not, not very many people bikes in, in, in Poland. So you need both to, to go hand in hand for, for a, a change in behavior to occur. I have a question. Uh, Reddit has uh, Tesslander Energy Agency in Northern Småland. I'm also coordinating all the 15 regional energy agencies in Sweden within the fossil free transport sector. So I'm working with a range of questions and we really need this ecosystem to work with digital meetings, public uh, uh, urban planning and so on. And if I focus on the same questions as um, in the Skikon Tools Studios work with Sweden, we have a sibling project here in my country. Uh, we're also working with the um, young shopping municipality, the biggest municipality, and there's a Facebook group with thousand angry cyclists uh, that are also a group that can help to raise awareness and focus on the really nerdy questions, which we maybe don't have time to focus on in the project. So find uh, people who are uh, aligned with the same questions as you are, if you have uh, NGOs or whatever, you can also help them to uh, lobby from the side because that is a small project and has have a lot of impact but still quite small so you have to reach out for more help and I think that can be a good thing find the NGOs and the groups uh, working with the same questions as you do yes and it's the problem is we, we have with this uh, COVID uh, crisis, uh, a new interest for, for this, uh, this, the development of walking, cycling, and so on. But now the problem will be how to, to massify and how to perennize uh, the, uh, the projects, uh, this, uh, this very interesting project, how to perennize the new infrastructure, the new urban planning and so on uh, it will be it, it 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 will be not very easy um, something else i would like to, to add something else also uh, in, in paris now uh, we the, the the line for um, the, the public space for for walking and also for cycling uh, uh, has been really really extended but the problem is now people want to 
by bicycles, but there is no more bicycle to to buy. So it, it's it's really something crazy, you know. Ah. And I said, Sweden is a national bike strategy. I guess we don't have a bike strategy, a national bike strategy. We have some call for projects or something like that, but it's not really, really suitable for, for the moment. Okay, people, do you have any comments or any questions for our speakers? So many, maybe you could have, you may have an interesting um example in in your country maybe with uh, mobility sustainable mobility yeah actually i don't know we touched upon the first question with uh, slido but i don't know if we talked about your second question marie laure how can i positively influence the people around me and encourage them to adopt good attitudes in the public space. So if there is anyone here who would like to say something or our speakers, of course, who have great experience on the topic, we still have a few minutes. Well, I can give some <laughs> crystal hair from Sweden if no one else wants to speak. Uh, I think one thing that is very important um, if, if you can encourage companies and municipalities, cities to get involved in this and um, make people use different type of activities or solutions to transport uh, when, uh, when they have to carry out stuff in work, like digital meetings, riding a bike to a meeting, try to use electric car or a, a biogas, biogas car, then they learn a new behavior that they easily can adopt at home. They, it, they, it's easier to, if you tried it at work, you can try to bicycle to, to, the sto to the shop or to the school. You can perhaps buy an electric car if you're tr driven one at work. So the policy of a work or a municipality or government uh, can influence people working there, but also in the, in the area of people living there because they see a new behavior and they can see a new infrastructure and they can get inspired by that. So I think that is a good start, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, Tess, back here again. Uh, I think um, um, what Krista said is super important. And I think meeting and travel policies is a part of that. And we've been, in, within the Red Project, we've been doing this meeting staircase. If you know about the waste uh, staircase that uh, European Union has, no waste is the best waste. And then you go from combustion and deposition and so on. The same with meetings. And because meetings are generating transport and travel, and it's good for active mobility, of course. But if you start with the meetings, uh, if you plan, should we really have this meeting? I think someone mentioned it before. Do we need this meeting? Yes. In that case, plan it well so we all have a good time and get um, whatever we need from that meeting. And then you decide if you want to go do it physically or digitally or a hybrid even. And if you need to move, then you go policy-wise, walking, cycling, whatever uh, options are, public transport. So starting with the policies, meeting and travel policy. I think it's a good thing to make things happen because movement and transport is a way of life and everything's interlinked during the day. So policies are good. I have a really nice uh, picture, but I can't share screen. So you have to, you can see it some can, at a time. I can make you presenter if you want to show it. Yes. Yeah, I think I think it's easy to show. And I haven't shared. There it is. So you st it is in Swedish. We haven't had the time to um, um, translate, but it is meeting yes or no and then with and then you plan it and then it's video or telephone walking or cycling public transport if you have a, a carpool car sharing or you're private and you're uh, go by um, plane I think people maybe are longing to go by plane and travel nowadays but 
I think this is a good policy thing when you go within your own organizations and organizations you work with. Oh, I see. It's a very interesting short. Uh, I don't know their name. Choice three. <laughs> Uh, not the strapan, it's what we call the meeting, the staircase of meetings. It's really hard, but meeting and travel policy in part. We have to find a good English name for it. It's still uh, it's version one. You can develop this further. And now you take, have to take back the control, otherwise I will start exploring the options I can do here. <laughs> it's a new meeting tool for me. I'm always curious. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, Therese. Um, so, Melissa, is it okay? Maybe well, it's... Yes, I think uh, people are shy today, so uh, we can close it here. And uh, it's uh, the end of our meeting, so it's perfect. <laughs> Even if people were shy. Okay, so again, many, many, many thanks to our three speakers. Uh, Joanna, Therese and Christelle, really, it was very inspiring, very interesting um, example of uh, energy sufficiency plus energy efficiency. And uh, this is really interesting. So thank you, thank you for your attention. Uh, we hope to see you in our next webinar on the, eight, on the, on the 8th of uh, January. Uh, this will be dealing with digital sufficiency. So uh, thank you everybody. Thank you for for attention. And uh, thank you Melissa and so on and Federen. So see you next time. Bye bye. Have a nice day. Thank you, Marilo. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Great. Thank you.